where everybody in this room um, has heard of Ecruji. Um, but what is it all about? Basically, you're looking at, and we talked about the action potential, right? We're dealing with the action potential. As you've seen before, what an action potential looks like, it's different whether you're looking at the action potential of the SA node, if you're looking at the action potential of a ventricle, if you're looking at an action potential of an AV node. They're all different, all right? Different shapes and sizes. So how does a doctor or a medical professional get to understand by looking at an EKG what the heart is doing in that particular area. That's what this EKG is all about. What you have here as an EKG is you get electrodes put on you. You have 12 leads, there's 12 electrodes. There's usually six that go across the chest. One, two, three, four, five, and then over here is like six. So you call it V1 through six. You don't have to worry about the, the names of these. But there's six that go over here, and then they put the limb leads. And what they usually do is put one lead or electrode on your wrist over here, another one on this wrist, and then one usually on either one of the ankles. Usually the left side because the heart kind of leans towards the left side. So you basically have three leads on your arms. Or I'm sorry, three leads on your limbs. Okay? So we have six across here, and we got to make up 12. So what happens here is that when electricity goes from this wrist to this wrist, it goes through the heart. That's one lead. But then you can go from this lead back to your right arm, and that's another lead. So right there's two, does that make sense? Then you've got one going from this wrist to your ankle, and vice versa, and then from that angle to this wrist, vice versa. So electricity goes through there and can sense and pick up the action potentials in ways that we are over the scope of this course. So that's how they come up with 12 leads. Six across, there's three on your limbs, but you double it because it's going both ways. Does that make sense? So then you have six on the limb. And that's how they come up with a 12 lead EKG. The EKGs have what we call a lot of waves, a lot of segments, a different parts of the EKG. And each part, whether it's short or wide or high or short, low, once you see what that is, and you can measure each thing, it gives you some inclination of what's going on with the heart. So let's look at what an EKG is. All right, It's nothing hard to understand. An EKG, as I explained to you, in the heart itself, every part of the heart has a different shape of an action potential. If we look at, let's say, the SA node, the action potential may look like this. If you look at a Purkinje fiber, the, e, the action potential looks like this. Where the bundle branches are, it looks like this. So different areas of the heart depict the action potential in a different shape. Does that make sense? And we talked about that, whether the phase zero is on a flat area or it's on an incline, right? So it's different for each part. So what's happening here is that those electrodes in its way, which again is over the scope of this course, but all those electrodes, those 12 leads, pick up all the different action potentials in the heart. And then it puts it into a machine, and this machine takes a conglomeration of all those different action potentials and spits out one image. Puts it all together, and we have this image. That image is our EKG. So an EKG is a conglomeration of all the different action potentials in the heart. Is that clear about that? All right. This is not an action potential. These are action. These are. I'm sorry. These are not EKGs. These are action potentials. It's just action potentials in different areas will come up with an EKG, and that's what we're going to really learn about: the parts of an EKG. There's different waves there. Looks like this. There's a P, there's a QRS, there's a T, there's a TR interval, ST segment, PR segment, all these kinds of things which we're going to talk about. 
Okay? Make sense? So, and why did they pick PQRS? It doesn't stand for anything. Apparently, when they first came out with EKGs, um, they didn't want to use A, B, C, D, because a lot of things at the time had A, B, C, and D, whether different graphs or something. They didn't want to use the end of the alphabet, X, Y, Z, because I guess there was a lot of people were doing calculus and algebra, and they always would say solve for X. So if there was any kind of confusion, they didn't want to get that confused. So they picked something smack dab in the middle of the alphabet, and that's how they came up with it. All right, just an FYI. There's no reason why the P stands for something. Okay, so what we're looking at, we'll go through this now. What we're looking at over here, in this area here, is resting. This is when the heart is resting. It's not contracting at all. This is the part when the heart is filling up with blood, right? You, as I explained to you, you don't want to be contracting the heart and filling blood up. It's not going to happen, or fill up the heart. Because if you're trying to get air into a balloon, you don't want someone contracting or pressing on the balloon. You can't get air in there. So the time that the heart is going to fill is going to be the time when the heart is resting. All right? So this is diastole, right? When the heart is resting. All right, so this is when the filling of blood occurs. So both the ventricles and both atria will be resting at this time. All right, and that's what's happening right over here. You don't see anything, it's just a straight line. Now, let's look at something called the P wave. The P wave is atrial depolarization. This is when the atria contract. And when it contracts, this is when the SA node fires, you'll see a P wave, and it spreads its electricity to the right atrium and the left atrium. Right? That's what, from before, okay? It spreads over it, and by the time the P wave ends, at the end here, both the atria have now fully contracted. Okay? So the P wave denotes atrial depolarization, or if you want to visualize it, atrial contraction. Both atria contract. Then you have what we call the PR interval. Okay? Now, it's this area here. All right? It's also known as the PR segment. Same thing. But the thing is, it goes from the end of the P to where the Q is, where the Q begins. So even though it's called the PR interval, it's really the PQ interval, but we don't refer to that. It's one of those things that's on my list that I'm going to, if I go up to heaven, I'm going to say, why did you call it that? because it's confusing my students. Well, you just have to accept it until that time comes, and I'll start talking. So I'm thinking about it even when I'm dead. Okay? I have this long list. I talked about my list, right? When I go up there, you know, I have this long list of people. So we refer to it as a PR interval. There's no such thing as a PQ inter interval. Don't even say there is. Okay? Anyway, what's happening here is that after the AV node picks up that electricity, that action potential, it's then going to spread down both bundle branches in the interventricular septum, and then it's also going to go into the Purkinje system, right? The Purkinje fibers. So that's what's happening here, is that it's, the electricity is going to go from the AV node to the Purkinje fibers. All right? At this point, the atria contract, and they begin to start relaxing. And at the end of the PR interval, this is when the ventricles are going to start contracting because electricity is going into the Purkinje fibers. Then we have this whopping QRS complex. It goes QRS. Now why is it so high? Because now the electricity is going through the ventricles. And the ventricles have much thicker walls than the atria do. So because of that, there's a lot more electricity going there, and the amplitude of the R is going to be much higher because of that reason. This is when the ventricles are going to be contracting, really ventricular depolarization. And this is when they're contracting, okay? It's going to be shorter. If you look over here, this here, remember, P wave is the atrial contraction, the QRS is ventricular contraction. The distance between the Q and the S 
is shorter than what the P is. And that's because the electricity going through the ventricles is much more quick or much more faster than the electricity going through the atria. It's quicker. At the end of this complex, both H, I'm sorry, both ventricles are fully contracted. Okay? So the QRS is when they're contracting and they're fully contracted at the end of it. Now, we also have something else going on in the QRS that you can't see. Remember, at this point here, the atria contract, and by the time it gets to the end of the P wave, it's fully contracted. And it stays contracted throughout here, but this is what's happening. The QRS is when the ventricles, ventricles contract, but also the atria are going to be relaxing. Now, when they relax, you should see a little bump, but you can't see it because the QRS or the ventricles contracting is going to mask the, the atria relaxing. The ventricles contracting is going to be much more prominent because of all electricity through this massive ventricles or these massive ventricles that you can't see it on an EKG about an atrial relaxation. But it occurs during that time. So atrial re relaxation is also known as atrial repolarization when you go back to the action potential. Okay, is that clear? All right. Then we have the ST segment over here. Okay, this is when the ventricles are fully contracted and stay contracted. So make sure you have a whopping amount of blood that's going to shoot out there. This is when, if you remember on the action potential, when calcium is coming in, slow calcium coming in and slow potassium going out, it gives you that plateau phase in an action potential. That's where this occurs in the ST segment. So that's going to tell us if you're going to have a good contraction to push the blood forward into the circulatory system. You want to, if it's if that ST segment is very short, you're not having a good contraction. Does that make sense? It doesn't stay there for very long. Then you have the T wave. This is known as ventricular repolarization. This is now when the ventricles are going to relax. Okay? Again, atrial repolarization or atrial relaxation is during the QRS. You can't see a bump there because the ventricles are depolarizing, they're contracting. It masks the repolarization of the atria on the QRS. You can't see it, but it occurs during that time. This here, the T wave, is now where the ventricles are repolarizing or relaxing. At the end of the T wave, keep in mind, the atria have been relaxed since the time of the QRS and now the ventricles are relaxed. So at the end of the T wave, you have all four chambers repolarized and relaxed. And now you start the whole thing again. This is going to be diastole. This is when both the, all four chambers are relaxed. And this is where, um, where the heart is filling with blood. Okay? Make sense? All right. So you can do this on your own, all right, it's step by step, and you can see as where the electricity is going in the picture of the heart over here, and you can also see where the, uh, where the EKG, where it's actually taking place. The events of the heart, you can now see with the EKG, and it goes around like this, okay? So you can see it that way. You can see it here, it's a little simpler for you to see, but you can see it also where the P, Q, R, S, T, and where the electricity is going. Or one of my favorite ones is this. Give it a moment. This is an animation that's going on. And you can actually see the electricity go through the heart, but down on the bottom, you can actually see the EKG moving. And you can see what actually happens with each part of the EKG with the electricity going through the heart in the above picture. <coughs> Let it run 
come one more time. Also, step by step, what each party is doing, and now it's all labeled here too. All right. So here you've got P Q R S T P Q R S T P Q R S T. What's the purpose of the P wave? What's the significance of the P wave? It's a sign of what? What's the heart doing during the P wave? The SA node's working, right? The, 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 the spread of electricity is going in both atria. The atria are contracted. So if you're missing a P wave, what can you tell me about that person? There's no P wave there. Is the SA, SA node firing? No working. Yeah, the SA node's not firing. And that's what's happening here. See? Here you've got QRS. T. QRS, T. There's no P wave. So that's an easy thing you can actually read. If there's no, if you look at an EKG, there's no P wave. Hey, the pacemaker's not working. The SA node's not working. That means the AV node is taking over. You see it? This is where, as you know, I like to have you apply it. Don't just memorize the parts. You need to know what does that mean instead of just atrial depolarization. You need to understand if that's not there, what's not working applying the material. That's the stuff that you're going to remember. You're not going to remember uh, just memorizing things a year later. But you'll say, you know what, the P wave is gone. No SA node. I remember that. Right? Applying the stuff. Okay, so how do you read EKGs? Now this is just an introduction. Nothing heavy at all. Okay, but I'm going to show you how to read them. Okay? Alright, um, so in lecture, I'm going to ask you parts of the EKG. But in the lab section, I'm going to have you read EKG. Does that make sense? You're not going to have a picture of an EKG on your lecture uh, portion. But in lab, you will have an EKG in front of you. And I'm going to show you some things how to pick out. It's not bad. In fact, students actually enjoy doing this part. Okay? It's nothing hard. Okay? As you already see, if you don't see a P wave, you already know, oh, there's no pacemaker. Right? That kind of thing. All right, so you have the systemic approach to get to an EKG. You note the rate, how fast is it going. You note the rhythm, if there's some kind of rhythm going on there. Note if there's a P wave. Note what the PR interval is. The QRS complex, is it wide, is it tall? And we won't get into the axis, but the axis is going to actually tell you if you've got um, more pressure on the left side versus the left right side. And we'll talk about congestive heart failure. Uh, later on, okay? So it's a systemic approach. You look at this, the first, I don't even have it on there, but the first thing you say is uh, this, pre this uh, EKG is for uh, Sam Jones. And the rate is so and so, the rhythm is so and so. You have this systemic approach, you could do this. So I'm going to show you these now, okay? So you should know the definitions when you do this. Now, what's happening here is that usually the EKG is on a grid. A graph. And you can see small squares, but when you look at it, especially in the back, you can see bigger squares, right? You see the dark, bold faced squares? There's a square here. See it? There's another square here. So you've got big squares and you have little squares. Do you see them? Can you visualize that? Okay. Now, I won't ask you about the numbers of what each one means. But I do want you to understand the x and y axis. The x axis is going to tell you time. The y axis is going to be millivolts. But you don't have to memorize for our class how many millivolts for each box. I'm not going to ask you that for time. All right? Later on, when you get into these fields, you will. But just understand the concept. So you have time going across here, the x axis. And you have millivolts, how much electricity is going in there 
with the y-axis, okay? And you have small boxes and you have large boxes, and that's going to help you to determine things. So how do you determine the heart rate by EKG? Now there is about six or seven ways you can do this. I'm going to show you the simplest way. Is it the best? For you guys it is. All right, but sometimes if the heart rate skips a beat, you're not going to be able to do this properly. But for what you're going to go through, this is pretty easy to manage. Okay, so if you've done EKGs before in another course or your EKG test, I'm just going to show you one way. Okay, and for my exams, uh, you'll be able to use this one way. Now, the best way to do this is note the RR intervals. Mm -hmm. You know where it goes up. All right, if I go back to this for a moment. All right, an RR interval is this. See, there's an R there, and there's an R there, and there's an R there. So you need to get the R's. You're going to see where those are. And you're going to count the number of big boxes in between those RR intervals. Okay? So you find those RR intervals, and you want to count the number of big boxes. When I do this for practical exams for students, they're counting the little boxes. You're wrong. You're going to get the wrong answer. You're looking for the big boxes. Okay? The best way to find the, to count things is to have it, if it's possible, have an R interval, or it's not an R interval, but where the R is, if it's on the line that's that has the, um, the, the darker line. You'll see what I'm talking about. Okay? It's usually the easiest way. It's the closest to the solid, thick line. You don't have to do it that way, but sometimes it's just quicker for you to get the answers. Now, once you count the big boxes in between the, the R intervals, now the only thing you've got to memorize is it has to correlate to the numbers here. In other words, if you see that there is five big boxes in between the RR intervals. There's a little formula to help you with this. If there's one box in between the R intervals, it's 300 beats per minute. Two boxes, 150 beats per minute. Three boxes, 100. So it's pretty easy to memorize. 300, half of 300 is 150. You go down to 100, and then you go back to like 25 and so forth. And you probably just need to go up to 50. That's really the thing you got to memorize. And it's not too bad. Okay? So let's do one together. I'll show you. When you look at this, there's the RR interval. And you see the big boxes. You see the small boxes too. Don't worry about the small boxes. You'll be getting the answer wrong. You'll, you'll be going blind, like counting those small boxes. You don't have to for this. It's the big boxes, right? There's a big box. There's a big box. There's a big box. You see them? You're going to try and find, this is where my, I think it's easier for me. You find an R on, let's say, the, the solid line. So there's, there's a solid line and there's a solid line. So it's kind of like in the middle. But if you can, even, it's no big thing. You can do it from the middle, but it's sometimes easier to count. See, this is almost on there. This is almost on there. Uh, that one's right on it. See it? It looks like it's right on it. Does that make sense? All right. This is just to help you with that. So now you count the boxes. So you count the big boxes. One, two, three, and like a little more than a half. You see how I'm counting it? So now you just go back to this thing here, right? 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. It goes further and further, but I won't ask you about those. So now you just count that. So if it's, so you go like this, 300, 150, 100, and that would be 75. But it's before 75. You see that? It's somewhere between 100 and 75. You see how I'm doing that? So the heart rate would be about 80, 85 beats per minute. Does that make sense? Because it's going to be between 75 and 100. So those are over here. You just have to go up to like 50. That's fine. Okay? But that's what you're doing. You're counting the big boxes. One, two, three, not quite four, a little bit less. So you can follow that. It'll be 300, 100, I'm sorry, 300, 150, 
100, and it's not quite 75. So it's between 75 and 100. And it looks more closer towards the 75, so it's going to be closer to, my guess is about 80. 80 beats per minute. Now, if you put 90 beats per minute, I'll still give you credit. All right? It's not 75, though, because it's not on the line. You see what I'm saying? It's not 150, and it's not 400 if you wanted to count the little boxes. All right? Is that, that's manageable, right? It's not too bad. Right? Okay? So now you got the rate. And the rate, what is the rate for your beats per minute? You have the rate, and this is what it is, as, you, as I mentioned to you before. If the rate at rest is more than 100 beats per minute, we call it tachycardia. At rest, right? You're not running a marathon and checking your heart rate and, you know, 150. Well, that's, that's okay, because you're not at rest. But right now, like you're sitting there at the desk, it shouldn't be 150. Right? So tachycardia, you should know this, tachycardia is more than 100 beats per minute at rest. Okay? Bradycardia is when it's less than 60 beats per minute at rest. Okay? Not too bad. We mentioned a few times already. Now, the word sinus. Sinus means for every P wave, you have a QRS. The one I showed before, there was no P wave here, that was not sinus heart, that was not a sinus heart rate. So if there's a P and there's a QRS with every P wave, then we say it's sinus. Their heart rate is sinus. If their heart rate is 100 beats per minute, or let's say 150 beats per minute, and there's a P wave and there's a QRS with each one, then we say that that is sinus tachycardia. That there is a P wave with every QRS, it's also going very fast, so more than 100 beats per minute. And likewise, we would also have on the other end of the spectrum, a sinus bradycardia. Okay? Questions on that? No? Okay. So this is sinus tachycardia. All right? The, I don't know if you can actually see the, the, um, the blocks over here, but when you look on your, on your PowerPoints and on the screen, you'll see it a little better. Uh, just the lighting here. So you look at the one that's going to be fairly on it. Um, looks like that one's closest. So you're going to count this. That's one block, so that's 300. The next block that's going to be 150. The next block is 100. So that's where the next P or the next R wave is, or the R uh, area. So it's between. Let me do it again. So you got 300, 150, 100. But it's not quite to 100, so it's between 100 and 150. So the heart rate on there, looks like in the middle, it looks like they're at 125. So the heart rate is 125 beats per minute, and what would you call that? Sinus tachycardia. There is a P wave with every QRS. So it's sinus, but it's also tachycardia. Okay, does that make sense? It's not too bad. All right. Now the rhythm, are the RR intervals, are they all equal to each other, the same spacing in between each other? So we could say that they're regular, irregular. Mm -hmm. Well, what that means is that the RR intervals are not equal, but there's a pattern. And I'll show you what I mean by that, okay? That there's some sort of pattern going on that, where they're getting further and further and further apart, and then it just starts back further and further and further. And there's some sort of pattern. So we say that's irregular, but there's a regular pattern there. So we say it's regular, irregular. It sounds weird, right? But then you can also have something called irregular, irregular, where it doesn't have a pattern. That the spaces between the R, R, R intervals, they're all different distances, but there's no pattern that you can actually see. It's this way, it's this way, it's this way, it's this way. It's, there's no pattern. So we say that that's irregular, irregular. All right, so I'll show you pictures of this. This is regular, irregular. Now, you can see from a distance, there's an RR interval. There's an RR interval. And there's another one. Notice that's wider than what this is. Do you see it? 
and then it goes again. But look what's happening here. Look at the PR interval. It's short there, it's longer there, and if that's the P, here's another P, but there's no QRS. And you go back to another P. It skips the P. See that? The PR interval. It's short here, it's longer here, it's longer here, and then it skips a beat. There's a pattern going on. Do you see it? Long, long, longer skip. Long, long, longer skip. Long, long, longer skip. And these the RR intervals are different for each other. But there's a pattern. So we say that it's regular irregular. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. This is irregular irregular. There's no pattern. Look at the RR intervals. The distance from here to here is not to here, and it's wide over here, and then short to here, it's a little longer here, it's long over here. There is no pattern. That's irregular, irregular. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, about the P waves. Are they present? If it's not there, you know that the pacemaker's not working. The SA note, right? You can also note the size and the shape. I won't ask you about that when you get into these other courses later on. They're going to want you to know those. All right? Are they normal morphology? Should they be round like that? Or do you see it going spiking? Are they different shapes? Okay? And are there more P waves than QRSs? Meaning that the QRS skips, as you just saw before. Right? So this is sinus rhythm. There's a P with every QRS. That's the P. P, QRS. P, QRS. So because of that, you have a P with every QRS, it's sinus. If you want to actually count the beats, you could do that. Like I said, it's a little bit dark over here. It's difficult to see. on here easier. This the third one is the closest one that's on it. So one, two, three. And it's between the three and four, so it's about eighty. When you look at it on your on your computer, you'll be able to see it better. It's just not picking up well with the screen here. So this is rhythm without P waves. I know it looks weird. QRS looks weird on this. But you'll have QRS. But there's no P wave there. So here's a P, QRS, that's his P. No P, QRS, P. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. That's what I mean. You look for the P. If it's not there, you can already comment about something about that patient. The pacemaker's not working. Okay. Um, see how the P wave is round over here? Round, round, and this one's a point. Now I'm not going to ask you about the significance of pointing around this. You should pick up with those things that there is some differences there, but that's how doctors and medical professionals could actually say what's going on. They could look at this EKG, looking at the different sizes and shapes of parts of this, and know exactly where the issues are in the heart. To know what a normal one is compared to an abnormal one. Okay? Same thing here. It's round on this P wave. Well, this P wave's gone over here. So here's one. This one's gone. Here's one, but it's a different shape. See what I'm saying? They get closer together, but you should be able to pick up with things like that. All right? Here's you have more P waves than QRSs. All right? There's a P wave. There's a P wave. There's a P wave. There's a P wave. But it's missing a QRS right there. So this wouldn't be sinus. Okay? PR interval, you could comment if it's long or short. I won't ask you about those. You should have an understanding with a PR interval what it's significant for. Okay? But I'm not going to ask you about 
is this normal knot in terms of the PR interval? Okay? And this is just showing you a long PR interval. As I explained to you before, it's short here, it's longer here, it's really long here, and then really long because it skips a beat. Okay? And these are ones with short PR intervals. All right? All right. The QRS complex, you could comment if it's wide, if, it's just, if they're all the same, if they're very high or low voltage. And again, doctors and medical professionals will be able by what normal is and you compare it. And they do all these kinds of measurements and stuff. Okay? So normal QRSs should be like that, but then like you said, like I showed you before, they're wider. From this point here to this point here, here to here, it's much wider than what a normal one would be up here. And they depict those things. Okay? The axis I'm not going to go over with you. Um, no real reason to get involved with it, but basically if we see something at the left uh, axis deviation, then it's saying that that part is going to be bigger. There's more pressure. There's a lot more congestion happening on that side of the part. And you could actually measure this with that. All right? 